Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and it's time for that inevitable video about Tiangong One, which is due to fall to earth this Sunday, April 1st. There's still a little wiggle room in the predictions, but as time goes on, it's getting closer and closer. The predictions are getting better and better, and it will be an epic end to a six and a half year journey for this spacecraft. It was originally launched on a Long March 2 rocket in 2011. In 2012, it was visited by Shenzhou 9, and in 2013 by Shenzhou 10. It was a well-equipped space station. It was roomy, it included all the amenities, including a space toilet, a food heater, and apparently 70 different items on the food menu, which is pretty cool, I would imagine, considering that prior to that, they were flying in Shenzhou capsules. Now, the original intention was to deorbit the complex in 2013, but it was kept in orbit uh, using the onboard hardware to perform remote sensing experiments while waiting for the Tiangong 2 spacecraft to launch. But that was kind of held up, and in March 2016, they lost contact with it and presumably control at the same time. Tiangong 2 would launch in September 2016 and has since been visited by astronauts and supply ships. Now, as far as space orbiting, uh, deorbiting space hardware goes, Tiangong isn't actually that big. It's about the size of a school bus. It masses about 8.5 tons. I mean, for comparison, Skylab was 80 tons and more than twice the size in any linear dimension. Mir was 130 tons. The difference is the lack of control. Now, Mir had a Progress spacecraft attached to it that performed deorbit burns and it was able to drop itself neatly into the South Pacific a long way from any uh, potential targets. Skylab didn't have quite as much control. They did have attitude control, so they could adjust the attitude of the spacecraft to increase or decrease the drag by uh, you know, presenting the solar panels to the atmosphere. And they tried to steer that towards the Pacific, but it didn't quite work, and some bits still hit Australia. Apparently, the local gov government uh, levied a fine against NASA for littering, which is apparently unpaid as of this date. Now, the nearest equivalent in history is probably the six-ton NASA Upper Atmosphere Research Satellite, which did deorbit in an uncontrolled manner in 2011 over the Pacific. Look, Earth is big, and the chance of it hitting you is really, really tiny. The chance of serious damage is low. It really depends on where it lands, and because it's moving very fast in orbit, the biggest factor in predicting where it lands is predicting when it will land. And these predictions are hard. With only a couple of days to go, the error bars are still plus or minus 16 hours. I mean, a few days ago, the errors were even larger, with like a whole week being covered. It's really sensitive to initial conditions. Slight changes in the physical properties propagate forwards and lead to bigger and bigger changes in the air in the time, you know, over time. There's lots of hidden data. The atmosphere can change density from one place to another, and it can also change with time. Radar images show that the spacecraft is spinning slowly at a couple of degrees per second. The rotation of the spacecraft is changing the attitude, which then changes the aerodynamic forces, which then, you know, again, messes with the potential landing time. Now, one interesting thing to note in the orbital information that's being published is that you have to take account of the oblateness of the Earth. Between the equator and the 42.7 uh, degree upper limit, there's actually a 10 kilometer difference in sea level because of the oblateness of the Earth. And if you look at altitude versus time graphs, it actually shows this oscillation going, changing by about 10 kilometers twice per orbit, in addition to the existing eccentricity between the, you know, showing a difference between the perigee and apogee. Now, the changes in the altitude also change the atmospheric drag, which of course then has to be incorporated into the calculation. So yeah, the time is still uncertain and it's easy to see why. The possible landing spots still cover many, many countries as of this time. There are holes opening up in the predicted landing areas, but most of the track is over oceans. On the other hand, re-entry will result in breakup. Light things like the solar panels will tear off first and land short, with heavier things continuing to travel further and uh, spread out the, the debris track. So uh, Mir, for example, had a debris track that was something like 3,000 kilometers long. 
So it's easy to see how, while it may start breaking up over the ocean, some parts may end up landing over land. So uh, yeah, it could be longer, it could be shorter. You know, Mir was descending faster because of that retro burn. So much is kind of unknown. But yeah, according to the predictions right now, Northern California is still under the potential re-entry track. And I'm actually gonna be in Hawaii at the time and that's also covered. So either way, I might end up with a little surprise present on uh, April 1st. Like if it enters over the Northern Hemisphere, it'll be daytime, it'll be hard to see. So you might see something, but if you're in the Southern Hemisphere and it re-enters over that, then it will be nighttime and it should make a nice show. So pay attention, right? Update, pay attention to the updates. We don't know what's gonna happen until the very last minute. If you're in the right place, look up or take cover, whatever you, makes you feel more comfortable. And if you're nowhere nearby, you can always start the movie Gravity about 71 minutes before the predicted re-entry time. And then the movie will sync up with the Tiangong re-entry scene in real life. So yeah, you know, pay attention. Look at, watch the skies. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.